Jeremiah was a man from ancient times, a prophet of God who lived in Israel around 600 BC, right at a particularly critical point in the history of the Jewish people. Jeremiah was a simple man who did not really want to be a prophet. Jeremiah was acutely aware of looking and sounding like a buffoon and believed he was doomed to ineffectiveness. Jeremiah complained bitterly about being required by God to preach God's message to the people. There was nothing beautiful about the message Jeremiah delivered, at least in the beginning. Jeremiah is known as the wailing or the weeping or the crying prophet because his prophecies about doom and destruction made everyone cry, including Jeremiah himself. Jeremiah was the ultimate downer. He wailed and cried day and night. No one wanted to listen to him. I can't blame him. Who wants to listen to a person who has absolutely nothing good to say about anything? That was Jeremiah. Instead, the people listened to false prophets and acted accordingly. Yet, Jeremiah was widely recognized as a prophet of Yahweh, even in his own day, even when he was giving his worst predictions of doom and destruction. Jeremiah had enough influence to be a significant threat to a lot of people. Jeremiah was even attacked by his own brothers. He was beaten and jailed by a false prophet, imprisoned by the king, and threatened with death more than once. He was hated by government officials and opposed by pretty much all the other prophets of his time. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31 records Jeremiah's personal view on the situation. He writes, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule as the prophets direct. And my people love to have it so. The people were hearing what they wanted to hear. Despite these challenges, Jeremiah, this bumbling, ineffective, unattractive man, earned a, has earned a central place in all the major Western religions, traditions. Jewish, Christian, and Muslims all honor and recognize this man. This man who predicts destruction and ruin. Jeremiah's predictions of extreme doom actually came to pass. Jeremiah predicted that Jerusalem would be sacked, the temple of God totally destroyed, and most people would be killed or taken away to Babylon. Jerusalem was decimated. The temple of Yahweh was destroyed. And the few survivors were indeed dragged off as slaves, just as Jeremiah had predicted. And this actually happened. I mean, we have considerable archaeological, biblical, and other written historical accounts that confirm that this really did happen. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple that was built by Solomon was horrendous and total. While all this destruction was correctly predicted by Jeremiah, very few people believed him. The other prophets, the false prophets, predicted that Israel would win this war, just as they had won so many wars in the past. The prophets of the pagan cult of Baal wooed many Jewish people away from Yahweh with the simple claim that Baal all their pagan God would protect the Jewish people if Yahweh was unable to do so. As the Babylonian forces approached, the hopelessness of the situation became clear. 
Neither Yahweh nor Baal had protected them. The followers of the pagan gods were killed and taken away along with the followers of Yahweh. In his role as prophet, Jeremiah actually had two very distinct jobs to carry out. Jeremiah first had to warn the people of the coming cataclysmic invasion. This warning did nothing to protect the people. They didn't listen. And that was not necessarily the point. Jeremiah's predictions of disaster served one key role. They proved, they demonstrated that Jeremiah was a true prophet because what he said to pass, the unlikely and unthinkable future that he predicted actually came to pass. Jeremiah needed that kind of reputation in order to fulfill his second task. Jeremiah's second task was to explain to the remaining Jewish people how it was possible that their God, who was still real and who was still powerful, had chosen not to protect them, but rather allowed them, the children of God, the chosen people, to be decimated. Without Jeremiah fulfilling the second role, without his ability to credibly explain how the temple of the living God could be destroyed, the Jewish tradition would not have survived this invasion. Being wiped out in a war is not just a political crisis, it's a spiritual crisis too. That's true today too, but it's even more true, even truer in ancient times. The question in ancient times was not whether there was a God, everybody believed there was a God, but rather the question was whose God is more powerful? If you lost a war, then obviously the invading army's God was stronger than your God. Jeremiah explained to the people how it was possible for the chosen people to be turned into slaves and still be chosen people. Jeremiah's leadership allowed the Jewish people to stay together and survive as a people despite the, dis the complete destruction of the temple, the temple of the living God destroyed, and the murder of most of the people. Now at first glance, it may appear that the lesson here is to listen to real prophets and not to false ones. The false prophets told the Jewish people they'd be safe. The false prophets told the people a very popular message, and almost everyone believed it. Few believed Jeremiah, but realize those who believed Jeremiah fared no better than those who did not. Everyone was taken as slaves, no matter if you accepted Jeremiah's prophecy or if you rejected it. The only benefit that the people of Israel obtained from Jeremiah's accurate predictions was that Jeremiah became starkly credible as a prophet of the one true God. Jeremiah's accuracy allowed Jeremiah to serve an essential leadership role with the people of Israel moving forward, a role he was needed in to explain this terrible event to the people. He had to explain that being crushed by the Babylonians was a form of God's judgment on the people's unfaithfulness as opposed to some kind of weakness in their God, Yahweh. The evidence the people had seen that Jeremiah was indeed a true prophet allowed Jeremiah to keep the Jewish people together as one people, even when they were taken away as slaves. Jeremiah, the one true prophet, predicted that Israel would one day be restored. 
But Israel had to learn to trust in God even after God's temple had been destroyed. The people of Israel were not ready for this. Their faith in God was twisted and entangled around their faith that God resided in the temple and in the promised land. God sent the people Jeremiah to help them take their next step on a spiritual journey that would require a faith that transcended the land, that transcended the temple, that even transcended their own personal freedom. Jeremiah's success as a prophet is not a message to us to seek only real prophets and ignore false ones. Like so much in the Bible, the, me- the, the story, the message of Jeremiah is more complicated, is more complex than that. Still, a tradition of prophets runs deep in the Old Testament and in human history. And we can assume that God will send more prophets to us in the future. There's something about the human experience that causes us to desire and seek out prophets and seers. In ancient times, there were lots of prophets. And in many cases, prophets or seers made a huge difference in people's lives. People would often make life decisions based on what the local prophet told them. And the track record, frankly, is not that good. Too often acts of prophecy have been more about making money than about God. More than one preacher or self-proclaimed prophet has made a fortune by predicting and confidently preaching the end of the world. When eventually these doomsday preachers are proven wrong, they just fade away, although usually with enough money to last a good long time. Yet we still love to seek out prophets, even today. Why do so many of us still show such interest in prophets? Our desire for prophecy, particularly when it's a desire to know the future, can be connected to our desire to cheat, our desire to to get ahead, to know what, what others don't know. This is an important consideration. Our motives matter. But as humans, we often honestly want to know what God wants us to do about a situation or relationship. That's okay. We want to know. It's not always about cheating and wanting to know something others don't want. Often it is an honest desire to know, God, what do you think about this situation? For some reason, we don't trust our own connection with God, so we seek out others for that connection. And depending on where you are in your spiritual path, this can be helpful for a while. It was helpful for the people of Israel at the time of Jeremiah. Eventually, however, if you want to grow spiritually, you need to learn to connect with God yourself. If we spend our time seeking prophets rather than on improving our own relationship with God, we can miss out on the greater opportunity that God offers us. The opportunity to improve our own connection to God and our community's connection with God. The majesty, the beauty of God stands before us in every moment. The majesty and beauty of God stands before us in every moment. Why do we need to know what will happen tomorrow or next week? It's been my experience that if God wants you to know something, you'll find out soon enough. If God wanted us to know when the end of the world was, God would have told us by now. Jeremiah probably sounded a lot like our modern-day doomsday preachers. 
But even Jeremiah was not foretelling the total end of the world, but rather an experience of destruction so complete that for one community, it sure would seem like it. Destruction so complete that the people's faith would be destroyed. Jeremiah's message was not about faith in a prophet or a prophecy, but rather faith in God during a very difficult time, during an incredibly difficult time, an unthinkably difficult time. In a lot of ways, for a lot of people, times today are difficult times too. Every once in a while on Sundays, there's a certain statement we read as a church that attempts to summarize what the United States, what the United Church of Christ is all about as a community of faith. If you look on the website of our denomination, ucc.org, you can find it there. One of the 11 points, one of the 11 points included in that statement of faith says, we believe the UCC is called to be a prophetic church. As in the tradition of the prophets and apostles, God calls the church to speak truth to power, liberate the oppressed, care for the poor, and comfort the afflicted. So if we are a prophetic church, should we be optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Trick question. Getting to know God is not about knowing the future. There will always be someone predicting the end of the world, or the end of our country, or even the end of our church. Still, if we make good decisions, and we trust in God in deeper and deeper ways, if we speak truth about love, if we speak truth and we act in love towards our neighbors, I can't help but to feel optimistic about our future as a faith and as a church. God spoke to the prophets of, old, of the Old Testament, and God is still speaking today to us and through us. God speaks to us, and he calls us to speak. Not just house our faith inside the walls of the temple, as comfortable as we might try to make it here. We gather at Pilgrim to listen and learn, to speak, and to live in a relationship of trust with God, just as Jeremiah taught. Whatever happens, wherever you go, we are the people of God, and our future is in and with God in Jesus Christ. Amen.